Right, guys, this is Mr. Hyatt uh, with part two of the chapter 10 Apes Lecture. Uh, we left off talking about ways we could reduce freshwater uh, losses in industry. Here we're talking about gray water. So, um, gray water is water that's been used but is still usable. So, um, you see here, flushing away industrial and household waste with fresh water causes pollution and is unsustainable. Um, think about when you flush, uh, somebody flushes medication down the toilet. So you take, maybe you take an estrogen supplement or a testosterone supplement or something like that. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's especially problematic when it's a, a hormone, uh, a hormone supplement. So you flush that down the toilet. Well, now that's in the water supply. So that water is going to go to a treatment plant that's going to be cleaned and then reset back out. So that, that testosterone or that estrogen or every drug that's ever out there has to be removed in the filtration process, and, and, and that's, that's impractical. So gray water is, like I said, uh, so think about it this way. Uh, you brush your teeth in the morning. You also use the bathroom in the morning. Why do I have to pee on, on clean, fresh water? Why doesn't my sink, the out of my sink, the output of my sink, why doesn't that go into my toilet? I can pee on top of the water that I just used to brush my teeth. That doesn't have to be clean water. I'm not drinking it. I'm using the bathroom in it. Why does that have to be clean water? Why can't, uh, why can't my dishwasher provide water? Why can't my kitchen sink provide water? Why can't... You know, there certainly are limitations. You could, I wouldn't want to use a chemistry sink in my classroom to water crops or something like that. You can't use gray water for everything. But you can do it for a lot. You can, you can wash your, your car, wash your tractor, things like that. Irrigate non-food crops with water that's been used for other things. Definitely not for everything, but for some things. So again, it's just another strategy to reducing your water use. Definitely something I'm gonna be trying um, this spring and summer at my house. Like I mentioned, water is expensive in, in my area, so I'm, I'm doing everything I can to try to reduce my water use. Here's the list, this comes from your book. Again, the text is super small, so I apologize for that. Um, but it's, it's kind of the common sense stuff that you've heard your whole life. Use low flow toilets and shower heads, take short showers, uh, turn off faucets while you're brushing your teeth, uh, wash only full loads of laundry, repair water leaks, duh. Wash your car from a bucket, use gray water and the hose for rinsing only. Uh, there's Choose wisely where you where you wash your car. Replace your lawn with native plants. That's really um, that's really common in California and places where it's where it's warmer, um, where, where there's less water. There, there's not enough water for grass to grow, so replace it with succulents and things that don't need a lot of need a lot of water. How can we reduce water pollution specifically? Uh, the best way to reduce it is just to prevent it. Just stop dumping stuff. Don't dump your medicine down the down the drain. Don't dump chemicals down the drain in, in chemistry class. Don't as a as a business owner. Don't dump things into the water. Send them somewhere else to be processed. Uh, we can also use natural methods to treat sewage. Uh, something like instead of sending your sewage to a wastewater treatment plant, have a septic system. Doesn't go back to the treatment plant to be reused, but it does go back to the ecosystem. Uh, of course, reduce poverty always helps. Cut rain, let resource use and waste. Slow population growth. Good luck with that. Um, so if we're looking at how we reduce pollution, what are the sources? Well, in rivers, strakes, <laughs> streams, lakes, rivers, reservoirs, groundwater, those uh, sources tend to be things that we do. Point sources, I think we talked about this a little bit in the fall, but point sources you can point to one specific place. I think I told you guys about uh, my, my grandparents' farm is on Sugar Creek. When I was a kid, I learned to swim in Sugar Creek. I, we were constantly in it. And then when I you know, I was maybe seven or eight, maybe close to ten, um, and, and a farmer upstream just started pumping his hog manure into the creek. It became unusable for us. We knew exactly where it was coming from. It was coming from one dude. He was pumping that, that pipe into the water. Non-point sources are different. Non-point sources, you can't point to one spot. Uh, it could be something like uh, there, <clears throat> there's, <clears throat> there's runoff uh, in a water table just 
downhill from a housing addition. Somebody is putting chemicals on their lawn that's running off. We don't know who it is. It's this massive uh, housing addition, so it's a, it's a diffuse point. As you can probably guess, a lot of times we call it a non-point source until we can find the source. We know it's coming from this area. Where's the specific point that it's coming from? We know this, this 10,000 acres of farm field is causing runoff. Which acre is it? And we'll zoom in. Um, did I skip anything there? No, of course, leading causes of pollution, agriculture, uh, industrial, and mining. Flowing rivers and streams, um, they have, you know, with the current, with the moving current, that changes things a little bit. I think I mentioned uh, rivers in the last slide, but I shouldn't have. Uh, the current and the moving water changes things. That's going to mess with our dissolved oxygen content. It's going to mess with our turbidity. It's going to mess with a lot of the conditions in the water. Um, so there's a combination of dilution and biodegradation to naturally eliminate waste. Think about it. Uh, you know, I, I talked about Kool-Aid. That was another lecture. <laughs> anyway, uh, if you dump a Kool-Aid packet in a gallon jug, it's going to be kind of purple. If you dump a Kool-Aid packet in a river, you're not going to see any of that purple. It's going to be so diluted that it's going it, to it's not going to affect anything. Uh, and then bacterial biodegradation, they're going to take in the waste, they're going to process it, and they're going to basically filter the water out. That doesn't work when there's too much pollutant. Uh, we see that from industrial wastewater discharge uh, or when the flow is reduced. So if we dam it, if we have a drought, we send the water elsewhere, we don't have enough water, our streams and, and rivers don't filter uh, wastes like they normally would. So we, we kind of make it harder for ourselves to pollute by polluting. But then lakes and reservoirs are kind of the opposite of that. They have lower flow rates, so they're less effective at, at self-cleaning. Uh, so they're going to have stratified layers like uh, a photic zone, a euphotic zone, a benthic zone, things along those lines. So there, there are, are layers. Um, especially if they're near urban and agricultural areas, they're going to have a ton of, of runoff, and you're going to see a lot of that uh, at the algal blooms and the cultural eutrophications, and and uh, the, the kind of around here we see it a lot on small ponds and lakes where uh, I guess it's July, August. They get that green layer on top of them. That's what we're talking about. That's an algal bloom. That means there's too much runoff from the the neighboring uh, area. Especially pay attention when you drive past golf courses because they put so many chemicals down on the, the grass because that's, that's, that's their business, right, the grass. So they put so many chemicals on the grass to keep it nice and green and, and plush and all that kind of stuff that those chemicals run off into all the ponds. And so late summer, every pond on the golf course is covered with green stuff or they spend a bunch of money on chemicals to try to fight the algae and you get lost in, the, in that chain of events. Groundwater cannot cleanse itself of wastes because it, there's not as much of it and it doesn't have the current that surface water can. That uh, surface water can. Remember, groundwater is um, like soaking into the. I, I use that fish tank example. It can take thousands of years for that to cleanse itself uh, of some waste. Groundwater has lower concentrations that dissolves the oxygen, so that makes the bacterial population smaller, uh, and it's colder because it's within the earth. If you've ever been in a cave, you know that when you go into the earth, it's always colder. So for those two reasons, bacteria just can't break stuff down. Another really tiny picture, all sources of groundwater pollution, none of this is going to surprise you. Burning fossil fuels and making stuff. That's it. So solutions. Like, like I said at the beginning, prevent, don't clean up. Cleanup is, is very difficult, very expensive. It's always easier to prevent the pollution. So substitute chemicals. Find better chemicals than what we use now. Keep toxic chemicals out of the environment. Darn sure keep it out of the water. Don't flush toxic chemicals down the drain. Don't dump uh, some, some cleaning chemical or uh, turpentine or something extra. Don't, just don't dump it in the toilet. Require leak detectors on underground tanks. Um, you can imagine that if you have an underground tank and it leaks slowly, it would take a long time to, to figure out that that is leaking. Uh, ban hazardous waste in landfills, which is kind of common sense, and store harmful li liquids in above ground tanks rather than underground, again, because it's harder to see it. And then you see the cleanup stuff over there. Uh, Going to be expensive and, and 
kind of ineffective. So how do we purify our drinking water? We're going to store it temporarily in reservoirs. If we, use, if we have forests and wetlands and watersheds around a reservoir, that's even better because the forests and the wetlands can filter, uh, can filter the, the sewer water or the, the rainwater that comes down, uh, in, any of those things. Uh, the, the natural absorption of water using the water in photosynthesis and respiration is going to filter out those toxins. Those uh, bacteria are going to absorb those toxins and the water that they release is going to be cleaner. How do we convert sewer water to drinking water? A couple, couple of different things we use. Microfiltration is what it sounds like. You pass it through a, a filter and the filter is going to catch all the big stuff. Uh, then reverse osmosis, think back to passive and active transport that you learned about in biology. Osmosis is passing water through a semi-permeable membrane. So it's kind of like microfiltration <clears throat> stepped up. Um, the, the water that we use in the jugs in the back of the classroom is reverse osmosis deionized water. So that reverse osmosis, again, pushes water through a semi-permeable membrane that we, um, sometimes we electrify it, sometimes it's a different type of filter, like a specific type of filter that draws in E. coli or something along those lines. But we're pumping it through using osmosis, drawing out the, the uh, the toxins. And then we're going to use hydrogen peroxide and ultraviolet light. That's going to take out a lot of the metals and the peroxide is going to take out a lot of the organics. So um, those, those three things, that's really what we do to convert sewer water into drinking water. Before I move on, keep in mind the stuff I talked about earlier with estrogen supplements, testosterone supplements, maybe illegal drugs get flushed down the toilet. All those things get into the water these three filters may or may not take all those things out. I want to encourage you to look at your water quality report uh, by law that your water company has to provide you a report every year. really want to encourage you to look at that next time your parents get it. Look at the sources of your pollutants. Is it fracking? Is it agriculture? Look at, where, look at what's in your water and look at where it's coming from. You'll probably be pretty surprised. Uh, ocean pollution, of course, is, is different than, than uh, freshwater pollution because we're not as close to as much of it. Um, but check out that data there at the top. 80% of marine pollution originates on land. So it's something we do and just ship it out to the ocean. We treat it as a dumping ground. 80 to 90% of the municipal sewage uh, from coastal areas is dumped into the oceans without any treatment. So it comes straight out of the toilet into the ocean. Not good. So it may be safer, we don't know for sure, to dump waste and degradable pollutants into the deep ocean where it can be diluted, dispersed, and degraded. Maybe. But that's, that's sort of like the old idea to just shoot our trash into space. We're, we're just hiding it somewhere where we can't see it and hoping that it goes away. Specific contaminants that we see in the ocean, um, viruses in raw, raw sewage and from sewage treatment plants for sure are really common. Uh, toxic chemicals, again, from, from pollution, waste oil from cruise ships, things like that, nitrates and phosphates, of course, from our runoff, uh, crude and, and refined petroleum, which, of course, gets biomagnified up to top predators like seabirds, and then, and then runoff. So how do we reduce uh, non-point sources of water pollution? Ag. Ag, ag, ag. Reduce soil erosion. Use, use uh, cover crops, use no-till, no use conservation tillage, use slow-release fertilizer, no fertilizer on sloped land, plant buffer zones, all the stuff we talked about in the fall. It's all, it's not all. So much of it comes back to agriculture and mining. We haven't talked a lot about mining. We're going to get to mining, I promise. Um, household sewage treatment. Um, so rural and suburban areas in the U.S. So we... we if you're, if you're in the country, you flush the toilet, it goes into a septic tank. Then the septic tank is going to use gravity filtration to filter out the solids. Then it's going to use two filters, depending on which one you have, to filter the water out. And then the water seeps into the soil and the grass and the plants in the soil finish uh, decomposing the waste. So partially treated wastewater, like I said, ends up below the surface. Water percolates down through the gravel and filters out uh, in, in, 
into your soil.